God is working in your life. God has been faithful. God has been gracious toward you on this day. I'm excited here today as we continue to share the Word of God and just experience and remind, uh, remind many and maybe introduce to many others uh, what really is going on, what in the world is going on as we remind one another of that which God wants us to know and that which God has already told us. And yet somebody else needs to begin their journey of knowing how to put this story of the world together and everything uh, to make sense as it ought to make sense. So tonight we're going to continue on on this series, Lest We Forget. It is easy for us to forget. That's why the word remember is always in our vocabulary. Because if we don't remember, there are some things that we'll take for granted. There are some things that will confuse us in the world because we no longer remember what it was that we were told. So tonight I want to speak on the subject, it won't always be like this. Lest we forget that it won't always be like this. Lest we forget it won't always be like this. I remember when I was a young, a young man uh, and I remember just thinking that there are some ages and some numbers that look so far away. I remember when I was under, under, under 10, just being 10 was far away. And then 20 was far away, 30 far away, and 40 far away. And I, one thing I discovered is that when you are beneath it, you always think that you won't get there. But I wanted to understand, child of God, as much as it is in the physical, so it is going to be in the spiritual. It won't always be like this. When I was a little boy, I always wanted to have a beard. And so whenever I went to take a bath, my mother gave me a bath, I would always take the form from the soap and put it on my chin so that I could have, because in my mind I thought it was always going to be like this. But then I discovered, as I have been experiencing physical growth, that it won't always be like this. And the truth is really for real when it comes to how God is orchestrating the spiritual journey of this world. And we are praying, Father, we pray for wisdom, we pray for guidance, we pray that, Lord, you may open up our minds, open up our eyes, open up our ears, and you do the speaking and help us to do that which you want us to do. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Come with me to the story, uh, the book of Second Peter. That's where I'm going to take all of our teaching here tonight and preach men here tonight. It won't always be like this. It matters for us to understand that as we look into the world with everything happening in the world, we started this journey on Friday night and we talked about, listen, we need to always remember that this world has gone wrong. And we must never forget that we are living in the last days. And it matters for you to know that some of the things that you don't like, disapprove, find displeasure in is because it is the fulfillment of the Word of God. It matters that whatever God says is going to become true. And so don't you ever forget that this world has gone wild and it has gone wrong because we are in the last days of the earth's existence. And not only that, we learned yesterday um, that, listen, we must, we must always remember Lord's wife. It matters for us to remember that even after being warned, others are going to perish. Even after, even after experiencing the things of God, it's possible for you and I, for us to miss out on what God wants us to just but remember and run to. So tonight, I'm going to focus on this story, and I think this one chapter in the Bible summarizes the times we are living in and what is yet to come, and the whole essence of it is, listen, it won't always be like this. This is my reminder tonight that, listen, no matter what it is, whether you're on top of the mountain, you are down in the valley, you are sick, or you are healthy, or the money is right or the money is fun, it won't always be like this. Second Peter chapter 3, and we are reading from verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by the way of reminder. So Peter says, first and second Peter was written just to remind the saints, stir up 
their pure minds by the way of reminder. So in other words, it doesn't matter which part of uh, First Peter chapter 1 all the way to 5 or Second Peter all the way from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 3. Or Peter says, listen, I just want you to understand, I wrote these things just to remind you. And I stand here tonight to remind many and to introduce to others that listen, there's something and things are going to roll out this way. Verse 2 says, I just want to remind you that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter says, listen, we are not going to remind you something that you are not aware of, something that does not have a record of it being around. But I'm about just but to remind you of that which was spoken before by the holy prophets. In other words, as he calls the holy prophets, he's indicating the Old Testament. In other words, what I want to tell you right now, it's not a thing that's starting with us. But it is a thing that has been around for ages. Not only was it spoken to you by the holy prophets, but it was also a com commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, listen to this, uh, know this first as we get into this thing, that scoffers will come in the what? In the last days, walking according to their own lasts. Peter says, I want to remind you, that scoffers are, will come in the last days. And as they come in the last days, they're not going to walk according to what God says, but they're going to walk according to their own last. And not only are they going to be walking, they're going to be talking. In other words, they are going to be marketing their behavior, marketing their mindsets. And he says, and they'll be saying, where is the promise of his coming? There's a scoffer's coming. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from what? From the beginning of creation. That's why I came by here tonight to remind somebody that it won't always be like this. Well, Peter says, scoffers, number one, people are going to come in contradiction to what the word of God says. They're going to come and laugh and scoff and, and literally make small and fun that which God has told you about his second coming. That there's a promise that Jesus Christ, this same Jesus who you see going up, is going to come back down. And he says in the last days, they're going to laugh at those things. It's going to act, they're going to act as if God is, is out of his mind. He lied on us. Things have not changed from the beginning till this day. Verse 5 says, for this they willfully forget, that by the word of God, the heavens, were of, uh, the, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with what? With water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly man. Verse 8, but beloved, do not forget this one thing. Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a what? Thousand years, and a thousand years as what, everybody? As one day. Here it is. Let's pause just a minute right here. Peter says, I want to remind you of something, that in the last days, people are going to come and make fun of the word of God. People are going to come and minimize the word of God. And Peter says, I'm going to remind you what the prophets told you and what the apostles commanded you. And I want you first thing first, scoffers are going to come. We are leaving at that era in that time that whatever God says is being questioned. Whatever God says is being given a litmus test. Whatever God says in the church, the same attitude, it's in the church. The same attitude, it's in the world. The same attitude is with the heathens. The same attitude is in the lost. People are looking around and saying, listen, things have not changed. But if you and I tonight were to be truthful, uh, 
I, I like this. If you and I were to be truthful, you'll remember that things have changed. If you and I were to be truthful, nobody ever thought there would be an electric car. If the truth was to be said, you and I, nobody ever thought there would be a camera on a phone. You remember, anybody remembers when they used to have those kind of phones when everybody used the same line. I mean, you had to pick it up and know how many times it would ring for it to be for your house. Otherwise, you would sneak in on somebody else's uh, call. You remember even telephones used to be plugged into the wall. Nobody ever thought you could walk around with a phone when there was nothing connected to it. So things have been changing over time. The truth be said, things have changed. Now we are looking and you're hearing me wherever you are in the world through this media of, of Facebook and YouTube which literally is less than 15 years old. So it's true that things have changed. Things have gone around. Anybody remembers? I don't know uh, if you still do, but I do. When Whenever you had a picture taken, it had to be processed. I mean, it was Kodak. You had to get taken, and two weeks later, you could see yourself. Nobody ever thought you could walk around. You'd be a cameraman, uh, a telephone man, and whatever else you want to do on your small little phone. My friends, things have changed. Wow. Bible says they're going to claim that things are the same only when it comes to what God said. They're going to question everything based on God's promise of coming again. And yet be grateful for the improvement of everything around their lives. And Peter says, listen, when they say those things, uh, they forget one thing. They forget that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years as one day. And Peter says they forget that God once told Noah that he was going to destroy the whole world with what? With water. And that word came to pass. The world then was destroyed as God had said. So if anything, we have a down payment. If anything, we have an example that the word of God will always come to pass. He spoke and he created. And he warned that he was going to destroy the world because sin was everywhere. And the flood came and everything was changed. And now God told Noah through the rainbow that, listen, I'm not going to destroy the world with what? With water, but it's going to be fire next time. And Peter says the heavens that we see and the earth that we, we walk on and see they are all reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So it is, so when you think that God is not doing what God said he is going to do, don't you ever forget that with God a thousand years, they are literally as a day to the Lord. So God is not in a hurry. God is not rushing. God is not confusing. God is not pacing up and down in his throne room wondering what am I going to do with the world verse 9 tells us what is it that God is doing right now what is it that the world has not ended up to this point verse 9 says this the Lord is not slow concerning his promise as some count slowness but the Lord is long suffering toward us not willing that any should perish, but that how many? All should come to repentance. Lest we forget, the world is what it is. The world is becoming what is becoming. Not that God is pleased with what's happening in the world, but verse 9 gives me my marching orders as a preacher. It gives me my marching orders and as, as an evangelist. It gives me meaning to what I do. It may look foolish. It may look like why bother do what you do, even when it doesn't look like it's working. God is saying, listen, I'm not slow in keeping my promise, but I'm long-suffering toward people because I'm not willing that any Anybody should perish, but that all should come to repentance. 
So it is, if the church of Jesus Christ forgets why we exist, we don't exist for programs. We don't exist for ministries. We don't, for, uh, we don't exist for buildings, buildings. We have gotten to a point where we are so caught up in things that don't matter. Sometimes we love our buildings as if when Jesus comes again, it's going to take our church buildings to heaven. The Bible tells me before he comes, no matter how expensive the building is, it's going to be destroyed. No brick on top of another brick. What's more important is the salvation of men and women, boys and girls, and that's where we are. Lest you forget, it's not about the beauty of the building. Lest you forget, it's not about how many programs your church have. Lest you forget, it's not about how mega your church is. Lest you forget, it's not about us. It's about the salvation of the world. And the Bible says God is not slow in keeping his promise, but God is long-suffering toward us. Child of God, wherever you are in the world, whatever it is that's happening in the world that you do not approve, whatever is happening in the world, even in the church, that you do not like, I have learned in my life that it's not about what I like, it's not about what I approve, it's about the salvation of somebody else. And we are standing here at the very toenails of human history. And God should have and can still end this craziness in a moment. But I'm grateful that it hasn't ended the world because there are many who still need to know that Jesus is still saving souls. It matters that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All should come to repentance. The lost come to repentance. The least come to repentance. Even those who are in the church come to repentance. And I like what Romans says. It says, listen, now how can they believe in him that they have not heard? And then it says, how can they hear about him without a what? Without a preacher. And this is what fires me up as a preacher, that there are some things that will never happen in some people's lives if I don't pick up my call and do what God created me to do. For the Bible says, how can they believe in God whom they've not heard? And then the Bible says, how will they hear without a preacher? And then the Bible says, how can they preach unless they are sent? So there is a mission that God has in this crazy world. It doesn't matter how chaotic it becomes, how the crises are. It doesn't matter who is doing it wrong, who is doing it bad. But we need to understand that the very heart of God is the salvation of people. Verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord, don't get it twisted, he's not slow. Concerning his second coming promise, but the day of the Lord will come as a what, everybody? As a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, lest you forget Jesus is coming again. I don't want to go too deep. I don't want to go too shallow, but I just want you to understand it's going to make sense when he shows up again. He is coming again. Scoffers will say things have never changed, but God says the day is going to come, and God says I am long-suffering because I need somebody to be saved. And that's why the church of Jesus Christ ought to rise up, and we need to get to work and start witnessing about the goodness of God. We can hasten the soon coming of Jesus Christ by telling our neighbors, telling our co-workers, telling our family members telling anybody who can hear who can see that there's a God who loves them and he wants to have an appointment to pick them up when he comes again and the Bible says because everything we see shall be melted with fervent heat both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up and 11 says therefore since all these things will be dissolved what manner of persons ought you to be 
uh, in holy conduct and godliness. I like that. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, lest you forget what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for, watch this, and hastening the coming of the day of God, because which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. This is the, this is the question of all questions. Now that you know that Jesus is coming again, now that you know that the scoffers are wrong, now that we understand God is not slow concerning his promise, now that we know that God cares for everybody's repentance and salvation, now that we know that the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night, then the question says, what kind of people to, are we to be in holy conduct and godliness? And third it says, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth in which what? Righteousness dwell. In other words, we have this anticipation, lest you forget. It's not about church. It's not about programs. It's not about titles. It's not about positions. At the end of the day, all these things are a set up. Uh, God has created a structure so that we can function for the salvation of others so that he can come and grab us and take us home. Lest you forget, child of God, don't let little stuff offend your walk with God because you need to understand we are living in the last days where many are more addicted to positions than their relationship with God. Many of us, it is easy for you to be addicted even to serving God than to being a worshiper of God. It is easy in these last days for us to be addicted to doing stuff and yet God, when he comes again, to look at us and say, I never knew you. What God is looking for is a relationship. All this stuff, being a preacher, being a pastor, is just God's way. It's bait for God to save me. God is not impressed by my title. God is not impressed by my efforts. All God wants to do is to work through me so that he can reach out and save as many people as he can and save me in the process. Child of God, don't get it twisted. The church has forgotten its mission and the world has gone crazy because the church has lost our meaning. We have forgotten who we are and why we exist for. I preached last night about Lot and his family. You discover when Abraham was praying to God, uh, interceding for Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, well, if you find 50 righteous people, and God says, I'll spare them. And he says, what about 40? God says, I'll spare them. And he kept on 30, and God says, I'll spare them. And he says, please forgive me, what about 20? And God says, I'll spare them. And then he says, well, please, 10. And God still says, I will spare the city. Here it is. You ready for this? I truly do believe that Sodom and Gomorrah, when you look at the story, ultimately was destroyed because God could not find 10 righteous people. The, the main reason for him coming down was to destroy them because of their sin. But when a believer interceded for them, he started asking and saying, God, based on those who love you, can you spare the unrighteous? And God could not find 10 righteous people. Allow me to make this conclusion. The world is what it is today because of the missing saints. If we were doing our work right, if we were sharing the goodness of God, if we were living the truth, the world would see that there has to be something better. And that's why a child of God is a powerful weapon in the mighty hands of God in these last days. 
It doesn't matter whether it's in your neighborhood, whether it's on the job, whether it's in the school yard. It don't matter wherever a child of God is and you are in the hand of God, you are an extension of heaven as a warning to the world because God is not trying to find and catch the world doing wrong. The Bible says he's not willing that anybody should perish, but God wants everybody to repent and they can only repent when the light of the truth of the word of God is introduced into their lives. So lest you forget, child of God, you and I have work to do. And 14 says, Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, the soon coming of Christ and the burning up of the heavens and the cleansing of the earth, be diligent to be found by him in peace. Did you get that? Lest you forget. Be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and what? Blame less. Be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. That's the goal. I mean, he's coming again. But your number one goal is for you to be found in peace and without spot and blameless. So everything we do in this last days, we have a goal, and the goal is for you and I, child of God, to get to a place where we are at peace, in peace with God, and for us to live right for God, and we can do it in this age because God is still doing the work of preparing us for his second coming, lest we forget. Somebody may ask me a question, Pastor. Now that we know it won't always be like this, it won't always be like this, that the bullies of the world are running around those who love God. It won't always be like this, that the Russians of the world can literally bully the Ukraines of the world. It won't always be like this. That's what the word of God says, that the Taliban's of the world can literally just but abuse women and children, boys and girls in countries like Afghanistan. It won't always be like this. It won't always be like this, that even in these United States of America, people of reputation and good people are dragged down based on the color of their skin. It won't always be like this. One day, he who is going to make things right is going to come and make things right. And in the meantime, somebody may ask the question, so what is it that I should do, Pastor Kambizi? Because the Bible says, be diligent in this one thing, that you'll be found in peace with God. And you may want to ask me, how do I fall and get in this peace with God? How can I have this diligence whilst I'm waiting in the unbearable? Because the earth is going to get worse and worse and worse till the one who is coming to change it arrives and so we have to be faithful in the unbearable rules are going to change laws are going to change that's what the book of revelation tells us we are going to be faithful in the unbearable we are going to be truthful in the unbearable and some of us just a little discouragement in the church you quit the church you go away you are so negative and yet when you read the word of god all those whom god is going to take with him when he comes again they are going to be faithful in the unbearable because when John is asked the question in Revelation chapter 7, who are this? He said, what everybody? These are they. What they did was take their robes and wash it in the water, everybody, in the blood of Jesus Christ. And not only that, they came through the great what? Tribulation. In other words, they were faithful in the unbearable. No matter how unbearable this world becomes, no matter how unbearable the church house becomes, no matter how unbearable your family becomes, God is saying, if you believe in my second coming, you must be diligent in the unbearable. How do can I do that, Pastor? Glad you asked. I got three things for you. Number one, be sure of your relationship with God in the unbearable. If we are going to make it work in this last days where the Spirit of God is being withdrawn from the world, and the people are going to get worse without the Spirit of God, if I'm going to be diligent in the unbearable of the earth, I must be sure of my relationship with God. Be sure. <laughs> There's no guesswork on this. Be sure of your relationship with God. Somebody says, how can I be sure? Well, you can be sure of your relationship with God by living in such a way that nothing becomes bigger than your awareness of God. 
Live in such a way that nothing becomes bigger. Your problems become, they cannot become bigger than your awareness of God. Your disappointment, your sorrows, your pain, whatever it is, your joys, even the positives or the negatives, nothing becomes bigger than the awareness, your awareness of God. Whether you're on top of the mountain, you're going to be able to be aware of God. Whether you are down in the valley, you must be aware of God. Whether you are leaving life aware of God, whether you are dying on your deathbed aware of God, this, this makes sure of your relationship with God. Nothing should ever be bigger than your awareness of God. Not things, not people, not circumstance, not whatever it is, nothing should be bigger than your awareness of God. Because my friends, we, we are going to be faithful in the unbearable. If you read your Bible, you're going to understand. Listen, man, uh, the book says, they that live godly shall suffer persecution. That's a guarantee. Not, you're not going to suffer because you are bad. Some people, as we get to the coming of Jesus Christ, people are going to suffer persecution because they are godly. <laughs> ah, here is the second thing you got. Not only should you be sure of your relationship with God, you ready for this? Number two, if we're going to make it work, you must show that you have a relationship with God. So not only should you be sure of it, but you must want everybody show that you have a relationship with God. It matters. How do I show that I have a relationship with God? You may be asking that question. You ought to show that you have a relationship with God in your following of God. I mean, there should be no two ways about it, no guesswork about it. You must, be, you must show that you have a living, thriving relationship with God in your following. You must show that you have a relationship with God in your fellowship. So not only in your following, but also in your fellowship. Your relationship with others must show that you have a relationship with God. And here is number three. You must show that you have got a relationship with God in your fruit. Matthew 7, 20 says, by their what, everybody? Fruit, you shall what? Know them. So at some point in your life, the fruit of the Spirit must become real in your life. Not only should you be sure in these last days of your relationship with God, but you must also show that you have a relationship with God. You ready for this? This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10. When he says, listen, if you testify of me before Man, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to testify of you before my father and the angels. But if you don't testify of me before man, watch this. I am not going to testify. At some point in this last days, everybody is going to seal their testimony with their own blood. That's what the book says. There's a persecution coming where you are going to die for standing up for the truth, for what you believe. I'm going to seal the deal with my own blood. And the Bible says they never love their own lives. They abandoned their lives. They loved God so much that they loved him with free abandonment that their lives were taken so that they could have his life. These last days, brothers and sisters, not all who say, Lord, Lord, <laughs> you didn't hear what I'm saying. I, I, I love this word of God. I was talking to God. I said, listen, why are you giving me all these things to do? Why, why do I have to preach like this? I, having two churches, and I wanted to understand, whatever I do in one church, I do in the other. So when people get tired in one, you need to understand I haven't even started in the other. So it's an amazing deal. If I'm going to do seven preachments in one church, it means I'm going to do 14 combined. And this is minus everybody else who wants me to come around. Here's what I've made up in my mind. I have made up in my mind that my relationship with God is going to define my behavior for God. At some point, the Bible says, when he comes, he shall say, well done. Can I get an amen? Because it was done. 
You're going to be sure of your relationship with God. And sure that relationship with God. You can't be waiting for Jesus to come and in your following you are defiant and everything that comes you are literally the one who is the cause of the rebellion in your fault. Jesus says if you don't pick up your cross and follow me, watch this, you are not fit to be mine. In other words, in your following, I need to follow your steps and catch up with Jesus. Why? Because you, my friend, you are following Jesus and Paul says follow me as I follow him. In other words, I have a relationship with him and I'm going to show up in my following. Matters as we wait. So somebody says, Pastor, ah, uh, showing that I have a relationship with God in my following, in my fellowship, in my fruit. How can I do that? Glad you ask. You can only do that, here it is, by keeping God significant in your life. <laughs> You must keep God significant in your life by staying more aware of God than the crisis in the world. Your awareness of God is what's going to make it work. Some of them may say, Pastor, go deeper. Well, it's Peter who says, let's follow Jesus, our example. That's what Peter tells us, that Jesus is our what, everybody? Our, anybody remembers him when he was on the cross? He was on the cross. There were many people there. There were many men there. There were many women there. There were many boys and girls there. But Jesus looked around. You ready for this? Jesus always made God significant in his life. And the Bible says he looked around and he saw all the people. But his prayer was, my God. My God, come on, talk to me. Why have thou what? Forsaken me. There were so many people, but the absence of God was what mattered to Jesus. He was more aware of God than persons and situations because God was significant in his life. No wonder even when he was about to die. Uh, he says, Father. <laughs> Into your heart, everybody. Into your hands. What am I going to do? I commit my spirit. Even in death, I trust you. If you're going to survive these last days, not only, you need, not only should you be sure of your relationship with God, my, 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 uh, my hope is what? That's what the song says. My hope is built on what? Yeah, yeah, but Jesus and his what? And it, right, I mean, you've got to be sure. You've got to be sure. Yeah, you've got to talk like Paul and say, we know, for we know that all things work together. And we know that nothing shall what? Separate us from what? The love of God. It was not a mental knowledge. It was an experiential knowledge. If you're going to survive these last days, some things you got to know. <laughs> you got to know that you know that you know that God is good. You got to know that. You know, man, on your way, on your way to, to the hospital, you just need to be, God is good. That's it. Create your own song. Don't just sing everybody's song. Everybody's song is their own testimony of God. You can sing your own Gibri song. All you got to say, God is good. Good God, whatever it is. I mean, you got to know that God is good. And that thing that you have, then I'll let you go. It won't always be like this. It won't always be like this. I, I've had an opportunity of traveling the world, and I thank God for the privilege to go preach the Word of God. And I have seen people in, <laughs> this someone has been on my mind for a long time, I can tell you that. I've been on, on, on now. Uh, you know, uh, f uh, flying to countries that could not afford uh, any, any, any better seat on the plane. I, I, have, I have traveled to go preach the word of God in places where my feet were not even stepping on the floor of the plane because the person sitting in front of me had to lean back. And you know, when they lean back and you are behind them and I'm 6'5", it means, listen, my legs are long. And in order for that person to have a good journey and for me, 
to survive, I simply had to lift up my feet just so that I, so, so by the time I get there, I've got swollen feet and, and yet you get down, get it and preach and hundreds are saved. And one thing I've always reminded myself is that when Jesus comes again, I, I've seen people drinking in first class and don't care about who God is. And I remind myself my day is coming when he shall come break the eastern sky and break the sky like a torn rag and step down in style, look in my direction, click his lips and clear his throat and declare the words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The day is coming when whilst we do the work of God and we look like we are losers, look like this is the worst decision you can ever make, look like you could have made more money if you had done what God has put in you. But here's what I've discovered to you, child of God. In this last days, don't be embarrassed by God. On that job you got, you are a secret agent for the one who is to come. You are not there for the money. You are there for the witness for somebody needs to be saved there. It's not that we sit, leave in this, in this community it's because our credit history is good. But God knew that somebody in that subdivision needs to be saved. <laughs> you didn't hear what I'm saying. Your, your number one purpose is a child of God is God. How are you going to save somebody around here? That's the attitude you must have. Being sure of your relation with God in these days and showing that you have by keeping God significant. Keep God significant. I like it when I'm driving on the highway. I like to observe my surroundings. And, and some moments I get happy when I just see somebody just, just I saw a man with a plate and the plate was a customized plate and it simply said Deacon. It says Dickon, and I started, I started chuckling. I said, maybe that's their last name. And, and, and it so happened that we, we came to the same gas station where we're going to fill up our, our cars, and I just had to ask. I said, well, I noticed your car has got Dickon. What does that mean? And this man had the brightest smile on his face. He got so excited. It's as if he was ready to give an answer for that question. And he said to me, oh, you didn't want to say I'm a Dickon at my church. That's not my name. That's my, that's my title for serving God and the joy he had we started talking about Christ and, and when I got in my car I said whoa and some, I'm not saying let's all have this kind of tattoos and what else stuff but we got a show at some point and Paul says I am not ashamed of the gospel some point in your life child of God you got to show that you have a relationship with God not only by coming to church, but by telling somebody else out there in the world who doesn't know that you have a relation with Here's the last thing that I get out of here. Uh, you must settle. <laughs> in this last days, Peter says, hey, listen, I'm just reminding you scoffers are going to come. They are going to challenge everything you have ever heard. But I want you to understand that, listen, they forget that God, you know, a time is nothing with God. God is long-suffering. So he doesn't, he's not willing for anybody to be lost, but he, he wants everybody to repent. So this thing is slowing down because God is on your side, is looking out for humanity. He wants the ones who are lost to be found before he comes again. So here's number three point. Uh, Pastor, it won't always be like this, so what should I do? Well, number one, be sure of your relationship with God by living in such a way that nothing becomes bigger than your awareness of God. And the second thing is that you need to show that you have a relationship with God in your following of God, in your fellowship with God, and in the fruit of this relationship with God. How does that work? By keeping God significant, by staying more aware of God than your problems. See, I, I like it when Paul says, listen, you know what preacher said? Hey, Paul says, I've learned to be content. I've learned to be what? Yeah, yeah. So Paul says, when I'm happy, I, listen, I am as joyful when everything is good as everything is not good. In other words, Paul says, there's something constant in my life. That's why he could say, I can do all things. In other words, I've learned not to have. I've learned to have and my joy in him is constant because he is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Number three, here it is. Settle your relationship with God. 
In this last days, you're going to learn to settle your relationship with God. To settle your relationship with God. Philippians put it this way. Uh, you need to, uh, to do your, your, uh, your, your salvation with fear and trembling. All right, the hearers, you must settle your relationship with God. What does that mean, elder? It means you must be sure. You must be sure. Pastor, how can I be so sure of my relation with God? You must experience the presence of God. You, you, you must experience the presence of God. Joel 2 says, in the last days, I'm going to pour out my water, everybody, my spirit. Luke chapter 11 says, God is so eager to give the Holy Spirit to those who what? Ask of him. God wants to be experienced by you. Settling your relationship with God. How do I settle my relation with God? By obeying the principles of God. In this last days, we're not going to live by our emotions. We're not going to live by our feelings. We're going to live by, we're going to be guided by God's principles and God's values. That's the book of Revelation. That's it. It tells you when we are going to stand for what is right, it has nothing to do with our emotions, but it has everything to do with standing on the promises. So we must live by obeying the principles of God. He is coming again. It won't always be like this. It won't always be like this. Now, sooner or later, he who is to come, that's what Psalm 50 says, he who is to come shall what, everybody? Shall come. I mean, Revelation 1, 7 says, hey, behold, uh -uh, he is coming. Every eye shall what, everybody? Shall see him. You just need to understand, Jude says, you need to understand, it says, Enoch was the seventh one, literally the seventh one, the seventh one to be created, and he looked forward to the second coming of Christ. Before the first coming, Enoch was looking to the second coming of Christ. This journey of God coming to make everything better and again has been the theme of human history. And child of God, it won't always be like this. But before it changes, you and I need to seal our relationship with God with a choice. The Bible says today, don't postpone it. Don't postpone your commitment. Don't postpone your, your decision, your willingness to go to the next level with God. As long as God gives you an opportunity, God is saying, listen, I gave you that opportunity so that you can repent. Don't be embarrassed to repent. <laughs> God is long-suffering so that everybody repents. So it must be a lifestyle that gets into our lives and we do this thing on a regular. Why? Because God is up to something greater. So tonight I want to pray for somebody who wants to say, listen, Lord, I now know that it won't always be like this. And Master, I'm praying for my relationship with you. Not only help me, God, to be sure of my relationship with you. Because don't let sickness question your relationship with God. That's why Paul says, we know that nothing, I mean, Paul was so sure. He says, to leave is Christ, to die, it's, it, it don't matter. Die, leave, I am sure that either way, if I'm alive a little bit longer, it's for your benefit. But if I die, it's as good as I am alive. To get to that place, that's what we want to pray for tonight. And not only to be sure of our relationship, but we ought to God to help us to show our relationship, to share. This relationship is so good that I won't keep it to myself. Anybody remembers that? I like that song, you know. Uh, God can be so good that you can't keep it. You can't keep it to yourself. You can tell yourself, I, I, I won't share with nobody. That's what the song says. You know, I, 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 but I couldn't keep it to myself. What the Lord has done for me. And that's what God is asking for. He's asked, the product is good. The product is good. He's coming again. And God is just looking for people to push the product. God tell somebody that he's coming again. God tell somebody 
that he loves you enough and all you got to do is repent and anybody ever read somewhere where the Bible says repentance is a gift of God so in other words you don't even have to create repentance God is willing to gift it to you so that all you got to do is open up and let him do it it won't always be like this soon and very soon the same God who promised Noah and kept his promise the same God who, who warned Lot and his family and kept his promise that God God has given us uh, a warning, three angels' message that we have to push right now. And at the end of this warning, he who is to come shall come. For God is not a man that he should what? He should lie. There's no shadow of turning in him. So, child of God, wherever you are, I'm going to ask if you need a prayer of rededication. I'm going to ask those of you who are in the house, if that's your desire, to please stand, join me in standing. And those of you at home, wherever you are, whatever social platform you are interacting with us, whether it's Facebook or YouTube, and you want to say, listen, Pastor, pray for me. I need my relationship with God. I need to be sure of my relationship. I want to show my relationship, and I want to settle my relationship. I'm not looking for another, for there's no other God but God. Can I get an amen out there? And if he says it, he means it. And when he means it, it'll come to pass. And we are praying, Father, thank you so much for this moment. We are grateful that, Lord, you are a God who has thought this thing out. You are a God who has already planned this thing out. You are a God who is working this thing for our good. And so, Lord, we thank you that tonight we are standing on our feet here in this sanctuary and the many others in their homes, that, Lord, there are many distractions. There are distractions from the issues of life. There are distractions from the political situations of the world. There are distractions from our career employment situations in our lives. There are distractions in our own family relational distractions. And God, there's so much that makes us think that this world is literally draining the joy out of us. And we thank you for reminding us tonight that it won't always be like this. Evil and wrong is not always going to be winning. A day is coming for we look for a place, that's what you said, where righteousness dwells, where right doing and right with God dwells. And God, we pray at this moment tonight that you may be with each and every one of us. Fix us where we need to be fixed. Restore us where we need to be restored. Restart us where we need to be restarted. Resurrect those spiritual gifts that we need resurrected and relieve in us. We pray that God, he may revive us again so that our passion and our love for you and your second coming may burn within us this hope of the soon coming of Jesus Christ. God, we pray that it may burn harder and brighter than any destruction that comes our way. And we pray that, Lord, you may settle this thing that we belong to you. We know you are settled on us. It's us, oh God, who vacillate and are double-minded. So help us, God, to be grounded and to be anchored in you. For we know that, Lord, he who began this work in us, he is faithful to bring it to completion. So until that great day, we pray that our names may be written in the book of life. Lord, we pray resurrect the church again so that we can witness and share that, Lord, there is more to this madness and chaos and crisis in the world. There is a man who is coming who has the power to transform and change the world as we know it for the better. And we thank you for hearing and we thank you for answering. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen and amen again. Blessings on you, my friends, wherever you are in the world. Bless the Lord for the members who are in here. Thank God for those who are at home. May the Lord continue to just but fire up our hearts and our desire and love for Jesus Christ. Be sure and may your, may your soul be anchored in the Lord. Blessings on you. See you soon. Amen. Amen.